So I'm going to start this off not with a traditional introduction, but with praise for you, James Wood. Praise from the back cover of serious noticing essays. But just because these aren't just friends puffing you, I don't think, which is kind of typical of blurbs. Yeah. There are some interesting points that are raised in this praise, although it is pretty wonderful praise, but let's let's go with it. Yeah. James Wood is one of literature's true lovers, and his deeply felt contentious essays are thrilling in their reach and moral seriousness. That was Susan Sontag. John Banville, James Wood is a close reader of genius. His work is by turns luscious and muscular. <laughs> oh, that's, that's something we should all aspire to. A sort of male ideal, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Committed and disdaining, passionate and minutely considered. Janet Malcolm writes, Wood writes, more incisively than almost anyone producing criticism today, his ability to transform complex, anxious thought into lucid, exciting prose is everywhere present. And finally, Cynthia Ozick, she uh, resorts to evaluative criticism on the back cover by saying that James Wood is our best critic. Oh, I like that. Yes, yes. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks with a sublime fer ferocity to enter Wood's mind is to cross a threshold from the reviewer common places that pass for essay writing into the intellectual daring that portends literary permanence. Ah. Welcome to the bibliophile. I'm looking forward to crossing the threshold with you. <laughs> so uh, in our conversation, what I'd like to do is to get a handle on what you do, how you do it, with a look uh, briefly at one of your favorite short stories by Chekhov called The Kiss, mm. and then get at, in conclusion, some idea of why you do it. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to just start with a, a little story. Many years ago, after university, uh, I studied politics and hadn't read much literature, but I had this desire to be well-read, well-rounded. And so I wanted to find a, some sort of guide to help me in this regard. And I went into a little bookstore in Ottawa, which the now famous Ottawa, <laughs> called The Book Den. And I found two books. I found Somerset Maugham's 10 Greatest Novels, and I found Clifton Fadiman's Lifetime Reading Plan. And if I can just read a bit from Clifton's yeah. preliminary talk with the reader, it's called. The aim is simple. The plan is designed to help us avoid mental bankruptcy. It is designed to fill our minds slowly, gradually, under no compulsion, with what some of the greatest writers of our Western tradition have thought, felt, and imagined. Even after we have shared these thoughts, feelings, and images, we will still have much to learn. All of us die uneducated. But at least we will not feel quite so lost, so bewildered. We will have disenthralled ourselves from the merely contemporary. Understand something, but not, not much, but something of our position in space and time. We will know how we have emerged from 3,000 years of history. We will know how we got the ideas by which unconsciously we live. Just as important, living in an age which, to its cost, has abandoned the concept of the hero, we will have acquired models of high thought and feeling. 
we will feel buoyed by the noble stream of Western civilization of which we are a part. This book, then, is a small act of faith, faith in the notion that many Americans, despite all the pressures inducing them to do so, have no desire to remain all American boys and girls. I do not wish to claim too much for the Lifetime Reading Plan. It's not magic. It does not automatically make you or me an educated man or woman. It offers no solution to life's ultimate mysteries. It will not make you happy. Such claims are advanced by manufacturers of toothpastes, motor cars, and deodorants, not by Plato, Dickens, and Hemingway. It will simply help to change your interior life into something a little more interesting as a love affair does, or some task calling upon your deepest energies. Like many others, I've been reading these books on and off for most of my life. One thing I have found out is that it's easy enough to say that they enlarge you, but rather difficult to, to prove it in advance. Perhaps a metaphor is that they act like a developing fluid in film, that is, They bring into consciousness what you didn't know you knew. Even more than tools of self-enhancement, they are tools of self-discovery. This notion is not mine. You will find it in Plato, who, as with many other matters, thought it first. Socrates called him a midwife of ideas. A great book is often such a midwife, delivering to full existence what has been coiled like an embryo in the dark, silent depths of the brain. Hmm. I was looking for a guide to help me better understand and contextualize and appreciate what I what I'd read, but also to introduce me to new experiences to help me avoid wasting time. Is that how you see your role? It's wonderful to hear those words. And they're they're oddly moving, aren't they? Because they're couldn't write like that now though interestingly all the sort of tensions and anxieties that we that swirl around the canon now are all are all actually there in in the in the fadiman prose that you read out i mean it's interesting to me as someone who thinks quite a bit about you know what books do for you that he's disavowing pragmatics in one breath And then sort of picking it up in the other. So he sort of says, this isn't a how-to plan. It won't improve your life. That's for deodorant and toothpaste and cars. But but it will actually (laughs) do these other things. He readmits the the kind of utilitarianism that that he that he's anxious to to uh, to leave behind. And I don't know that we can thoroughly avoid it. There's a lot of anguished questioning going on at the moment in English departments as the numbers of English majors precipitously declines decline. Yes, about about exactly these questions that Fadiman more innocently foists on us. But they're the same questions. Is there a canon? Whose definition and what is the definition of the great and the good? When we encounter these texts, whether it's Dickens or Zadie Smith, what do they do for us? And how do we uh, make a case for what they do for us as distinct you know, a, a distinct case different from, say, what studying computer stuff, you know, code, code does for mm-hmm. you. It's all there in, in, in more innocent form in, in Fadiman's wonderful kind of mid 20th century um, boosterism. Well, let's get your specific relationship with the canon. Yeah. Well, I think a way to answer that is actually much as you did through, through anecdote. As a teenager, 15 or 16 years old, I was much taken with a simpler form of that Fadiman uh, book, a book that I found at Waterloo Station on the remainder pile called Novels and Novelists by Martin Seymour Smith. And it was a collection of pieces about the history of the novel, novelists at work, uh, wonderfully illustrated. It was like a coffee table book, really, wonderfully illustrated. And then it had at its back an, an A to Z of novelists of the last three or 400 years. And each novelist was sort of ranked out of a out of five on readability, plot, characterization, and literary quality. An absurd <laughs> sort of thing, really. It's like Cecil <laughs> and Ebert. 
but I absolutely loved it. I mean, it, it <laughs> spoke to that sort of train spotterish, nerdy quality yes. that, that we we'll yeah. have as a teenager. And I used it as my reading list. So it, when Martin Seymour Smith told me that, say, V.S. Naipaul was among a handful of the most important novelists writing in English, I sort of sat up and thought, OK, so like a good student, uh, this must be someone I must read because surely to be educated is to read a writer who is described as belonging to a handful of the most important writers writing in English. So I think for a long time, I had a pretty, like you, a pretty uncomplicated relationship to uh, the canon. Uncomplicated because of greed and speed, right? You need yeah. to get on fast. And there's a great deal of, which is still true for, for, for my students, there's a great deal you just have to get under your belt. And you have to get that under your belt even now when our ideas of the canon are so much more expansive and complicated and et cetera than they, than they were certain, certainly in Clifton Fadiman's time. You know, if you're going to be thinking about, say, the European novel, I don't see that you can really avoid Don Quixote, Madame Bovary, Middlemarch. War and Peace. Absolutely, War and Peace. Even though you might, I suppose, possibly, potentially, individually, like none of those books, you've still got to, to know them. So... I guess I'll, I'll put it like this. My relationship to the canonical was for a long time that of the slightly anxious, avaricious, eager student, happy to be told by, as it were, the master, what the masterpieces were. As I've got older and as I've got more confident, thank goodness, I'm probably a little less enthralled, not, I think, not to great work, I but a little less enthralled to the idea of, you know, my list of a, a sort of fadiman esque list, which I must tick off one piece by piece. And I've become more interested over the years in, I suppose one might call it minor work in a way. I'm, I, I'm as interested in reading, you know, Jean Rhys or Henry Green as I am in making sure that I'm, you know, solid on Virginia Woolf and Joyce, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I like the idea of, picking up books that haven't been written about much or praised much. And I'm trying to do that, as you can see, at the New Yorker quite a bit. I, I try to, I think for an American audience, that often means going to books in translation, going to European fiction that they might miss. And in that sense, I, I've, I suppose I've, I've had some success because I think it's fair to say that, that when I first wrote about Elena Ferrante, a small readership knew about her earlier work, um, The Lost Daughter and so on, um, Days of Abandonment. Um, but it was a small group of people who who had read her in the Europa editions. And then along she comes with the first of the Neapolitan books, uh, My Brilliant Friend. And I wrote a piece about her and then a Ferrante fever um, began. But as I saw it when I was writing about her at that point, I was simply saying to readers, here's someone you probably haven't heard about. What do you think? Um, so I don't know that I've exactly answered your question, but that's, I think, what I'm doing at the moment as a as a as a critic. At, at the, yeah, put in mind of Edmund Wilson, who really felt that literature was an international community. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm I'm very mindful of that. And when I went to the New Yorker in 2007, I started thinking about that. I mean, I started thinking a little bit about the people who had written about books for that magazine over the years and a little bit before me George Steiner had had I suppose taken a sort of masterpiece approach uh, as was his wont but it was more interesting to me to go back to yes the days of Edmund Wilson in the 40s 50s and 60s when where you can see he sees his job pedagogically it's to it's to say to readers I don't think you probably know much about Pushkin so I'm going to tell you all about Pushkin um, and he writes a very entertaining, long, deeply readable uh, piece about Eugene Onegin and and Pushkin. It helped, of course, that he that he was that he was so curious about languages too, and so um, capable in languages. But I think that's such a that's such a fine tradition. And I'll just say here, uh, Nigel, that that I graduated, as it were, from that coffee table book, probably at some point in my twenties, to the very humane and capacious criticism of the English writer V.S. Pritchett, who in some ways as a critic was the, was, the, was, the, was the sort of slightly less bombastic 
English version of Edmund Wilson. You know, if I always say to my students when they come to me and say, how can I find out more about literature? I say, get hold of the thousand page book of collected essays by V.S. Pritchard. And in it, you will find wonderfully readable essays about everyone from Cervantes to Salman Rushdie. You will see the, the, the European novel laid bare by Pritchard. It's not, it's not sort of rigorous academic criticism. It belongs to that sort of humane tradition, but it, but it does have the advantage of being written by someone who was himself a wonderful writer and a, and a wonderful fiction writer too. I think there's a nice parable for our times, by the way, in the in, in the fact that uh, V.S. Pritchett's granddaughter, uh, Georgia Pritchett, is the um, is one of the main producers and screenwriters for the uh, TV show Succession. So I like to think that uh, the ear for dialogue was passed from grandfather to granddaughter because V.S. had a fantastic ear, for, actually, for speech, which you can find in his stories. But I still remain quite fiercely faithful to that idea of being taught things by humane readers who have themselves read a lot and can communicate through language uh, their passion. And um, I, I, I suppose I, I'm trying to do that. Okay. We haven't got to evaluation, though. And what I experienced reading Somerset Mom's list of 10 greatest novelists was I was in my late 20s early 30s prior to having children <laughs> yeah so I had the time and I used to race back home to get back into these phenomenally exciting worlds and I'm talking the Russians mm. I guess specifically but but generally that top 10 list. Yeah. The experience was, it wasn't as good as having sex with someone who loves you and you love, wasn't that good. But it was on par with having a wonderful meal with really smart friends. Mm. That's how good it was. I, in terms of the richness of the experience. So... What I'm looking for is more of that. Yeah. It may not be on Clifton's list. Right. And so I want someone to, t- <laughs> to give me an updated list of how to spend my time in that phenomenally good way. Obviously, it's my book when I read it. But Clifton hasn't steered me wrong. Right. Uh, maybe that's because he's an old white guy like I am. I don't know. But he ha- he didn't steer me wrong. And that's what I want in a critic. And it, is that something that you feel you should give me or not? Um, yeah, I suppose so. I, I, being a creature of my time, I have a little less of the certainty you know, there was a kind of um, there was a kind of certainty around evaluation and the need for evaluation that was very characteristic of that period, just after the war, I suppose, in Anglophone culture. And it's where you get it's where you get sort of you know people like John Berryman saying, you know, twenty of Shakespeare's sonnets seem to me first rate. The, the, <laughs> Milton was right. not quite great. But, you know, there was a lot of that going on. And and yeah. to go back to 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 that earlier analogy i mean some of it was a little bit some of it i think was catering to a kind of um competitive avarice uh amongst read it, it seems of its time because as we know post war in places like america there was a for the first time really a large well educated readerly audience uh this was the time you know going into the 60s when say bellows herzog could be at the top of the bestseller lists for week after week it was a period when when both serious reading of fiction and actually reading of literary criticism uh, by ordinary readers went hand in hand and and with it a certain certainty about authority and 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 the and authoritative lineages that's to say you know i tell you what to read uh, i tell you what the f- f- the five five greatest russian novels are and you uh, accept my wisdom well, I don't necessarily accept it at face 
I go and read those. Yes, and then you go and read them. Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. right. And if I have a good, if I have a great experience, then I think, yeah, he or she knows what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I didn't always agree with Martin Seymour Smith in novels and novelists, as it turned out when when I got to read the stuff he he said I should be reading. But more often than not, he was he was right. And as for me, as probably as, as it sounds like for you, the the encounter. In, in translation with those Russian novelists, the encounter with Tolstoy, with Dostoevsky, with Gogol and Chekhov was for me absolutely massive. Uh, um, it's often occurred to me because I think about I went went once to Russia in 1994 and I would very much like to return. And I was thinking about going back and thinking that in many ways I know I know the 19th century Russian tradition, literary tradition, better than any other one, better than the 19th century French novel better than the, the English novel of the 19th century. That's the one where I can really make connections. And I have a, also a very strong biographical sense of what all those writers were up to and the, the religious crises and Tolstoy dying in the ra- railway station in 1910, surrounded by acolytes. And you know, all, I know all that stuff. And it's wonderful to think, you know, that was this. If you look back at, say, Virginia Woolf's reading, in the 1920s the same thing was happening to her um she was except she was reading literally for the first time translations by her friend constance garnett of dostoevsky of chekhov and yeah, tolstoy and it so just blew good. her mind you can they, see well, it they're so her mind. Good. Likes... you know they blew my mind 60 80 years later right and just last was it last year or the year before i think it was last year my wife claire masood was reading to me um she started reading um, Vasily Grossman's uh, great book, Stalingrad, and she was so struck by passages. She would read them out to me, read them out aloud in bed. And we would both stop after she'd read and we would say, you know, this is truly the Tolstoy uh, of the Second World War. Uh, it happened again. There was someone there ready to write the great epic of the Second World War. And thank God he did. I haven't actually read Vasily Grossman and it's on my it's on my list of I've got to read him. Um, but I, I know what, what an effect that, that writing had on her. Sorry, I got I got thrown off course a bit. Yeah, I don't know where yeah, I went. It's uh, knowing but, uh, it's yeah, knowing the Russians, knowing the background. Yeah, yes, you were asking me about sort of certainty of evaluation. Well, no, I what I'm getting I want to get at is Okay, we had this phenomenon. I mean, that's why I think I bonded with you as a critic. I had gone through this, and then you were writing beautifully about it, about exactly what I had was moved by, and and layering and providing more detail to explain the impact that it had on me. And I, I loved reading that. I, I don't think it would have been anywhere. Obviously, it wouldn't have been the same if I hadn't that had the reading experience, the unparalleled reading experience. So the question is, <laughs> how did they do it? <laughs> I want to read a quote from Henry James here, okay? Yeah. And it goes like this. I am far from intending by this to minimize the importance of exactness, of truth of detail. One can speak best from one's own taste, and I may therefore venture to say that the air of reality, solidity of specification, seems to me to be the supreme virtue of a novel, the merit in which all its other merits helplessly and submissively depend. If it be not there, they are all as nothing. And if these be there, they owe their effect to the success with which the author has produced the illusion of life. Cultivation of this success, the study of this exquisite process, form to my taste the beginning and end of the art of the novelist. Wow. What's that from, Nigel? It's very lovely. That's from The Art of Fiction. And I so I read it, but I'd forgotten it. Wow, that's moving. It was lovely to hear those words. Yeah, well, they pick up on your lifeness. This is the big 
debate that took place on the internet way back when, when I was blogging. There's a one faction that shits all over realism and says it's mm-hmm. fashioned and white, male. Yep. And the one that says you need to experiment with, I'm not sure what, ideas and f- structures and, you know, playing with one letter of the alphabet and leaving it out or putting it in or whatever it is. Sure. I remember well those times uh, and and that kind of atmosphere on some of those blogs, yours included. That binarism never made any sense to me. I, I mean, I, I recognized it was fairly easy for me to recognize how I was being caricatured, but I could see also that they were digging themselves into their own caricature. Surely you can split the difference and say that what's really interesting about realism with a small r is that various aesthetic definitions of it change over time that you know henry james wanted to do a different thing from what jane austen wanted to do virginia wolf in turn wanted to do a different thing from what you know goldsworthy and arnold bennett were up to that very few of these writers actually resemble each other i mean the thing i like like always to return to is if if you had as as is sometimes alleged about someone like me a fixed idea of realism or the real you actually wouldn't be able to read very many you wouldn't be able to read a great variety of books. I mean, it would be almost impossible to sort of move from Tolstoy to Sebald, Dostoevsky to, you know, uh, Rachel Cusk, because you would you would have to throw out every other book that you encountered as not somehow coming up to your idea of realism. Instead, surely it's better to see, you know, when when James uses a term like the illusion of life. When you look at the things that James holds dear in that passage you you read, solidity of specification, air of reality, illusion of life, um, there are very few writers of whatever aesthetic viewpoint who would disagree, who could take much issue with those desiderata for creating art, right? They could, I think. That's the thing. Does it have to be true to reality in order to produce the kind of wonderful experience that we've had, or does it not? Can you create that kind of incredible experience by doing something other than replicating life? My own instinct is for a kind of fiction that is closer to, I suppose, life and its dilemmas um, than to a sort of strict formalism but i think james of all people who was you know a considerable formalist i think he would say look it's the artist who makes life uh yes i might set a novel in london or florence or venice or new york but you know james isn't sort of theodore dreiser dragging Mm -hmm. a a, a camera lens through through the city um interested in different classes and their incomes and uh, and so on well and also presenting some sort of polemical view right james is often about creating the real on the page with so much sort of formalist power uh, that often one feels in james's case that you're in you're as much in a linguistic universe as you are in, yes. a, in a phenomenal universe right very floral or go back to someone like jane austen right i think jane austen is clearly a realist interested in gritty stuff like Mm. how desperately important it is for women to to find someone to marry and to be set up otherwise they will be in all sorts of destitute yeah she's a fantastic comedian who gets her power from that that comic power comes from uh, an, an awareness of human vanity and folly you know someone like mr collins or lady catherine de burr in pride and prejudice mm. but she's also a writer who by say the standards of later 19th century realism has almost none of the elements of traditional realism she hardly ever stops to describe what someone's face looks like she never describes what they're wearing or what their clothes are like she's the opposite of you know emma bovary came out of the farm wearing a blue merino wool dress and with three flounces on it that's just not austin's way it's actually a very stripped down world with actually surprisingly little solidity of specification to use the the james's term and maybe Mm -hmm. this is why james by the way didn't particularly like jane austen so i'm always i'm always constantly adjusting my idea of what realism is 
Mm. And instead, I'm always saying to myself, and I say, say, I say this, for instance, when I go to a Beckett play, I, I'm always saying to myself, how little solidity of specification can the writer get away with and still create something that seems to me to speak to my grounded dilemma, right? So, so how is it that a play which doesn't follow sort of realist uh, laws, right? Right, let's say, yep. In well, which, like in the Happy Days. Yeah. She's sitting in a mound. It's, it's so unrealistic, and yet it's right. so human, isn't it? Right. And in Endgame, you might remember the two parents are kept in, they're at the backstage, they're kept in basically sort of cans. Sometimes, you, you know, the top is opened and you might feed one of the old uh, aged peas and then you, you put the, the top down and, and forget about them. Uh, weirdly, weirdly like um, how sometimes we have to live in relation to our, to our parents. Um, but yeah, so, so for me, it's always this thing of what, how little solidity of specification. Look at a Lydia Davis short yeah, story, which is often yeah, yeah. more like a more more like a dramatic monologue. You can have a Davis story, which is three paragraphs, a genderless, uh, nameless speaker, and yet what's summoned in those three paragraphs is intensely human and intensely real. That will always be the kind of art that speaks to me. I, well, it's I, the I, end result, isn't it? Though I mean, it's how you're you're feeling, you're responding. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's not so much a a question of how they get there. Uh, I mean, that's what you want to do is examine that. But it's also the end result is what uh, the re- me, the reader, I want that great buzz. Absolutely. I'm sometimes aware that when I'm writing about people, I suppose this also was a charge against me a few years ago. I'm sometimes aware that when writing about people who provide, as it were, less of that solidity of specification, to use, say, Lydia Davis as an example, but yeah. other writers I've written about, um, people like um, sort of Alejandro Zambra, say, I'm sometimes aware that I, in order to make a story up about them, as it were, in a, in a piece I might write for, for my readers, perhaps the story I tell about them is more of a realist story, if that makes sense. In other words, mm-hmm. I wrench them a little bit into a kind of recognizable uh, realist humanism than they actually belong to. I remember... Our, our old friend, uh, the, the deceased uh, Edmund Caldwell, specifically felt this was the case about the way I read the Hungarian writer Laszlo Krasna Hawkeye. He felt, I think, that I read Krasna Hawkeye as almost a realist novelist writing about, about madness. And his point as an anti-realist was, no, 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 really Krasna Hawkeye is just writing about about language, about the slippage of, of words. And I, I don't think that's true. But it's probably also the case that I have a slight tendency because of my interest in the in in the real to to wrench avant-garde writers a little bit towards the normative. But, you know, so be it. All, all reading is wrenching. Right. I mean, it's always said about reviewers, you know, you should re- review the book in front of you. You shouldn't uh, you shouldn't demand that the book be something other than it is. But that's what criticism is. Um, when you say this isn't good enough. Uh, or I don't like it, you're implicitly saying, because I think it should be another kind of book. And if you're a certain kind of critic, um, you tend to go on to say, now, let me tell you what this other kind of book should be. Um, that can be annoying and obnoxious, but I don't think it's it's really avoidable. Well, what, I think what's great about a, a review is following the reviewer's mind as they try and figure out why they like it or dislike it and going right. along the ride. Right. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm offering accounts of books, but at the same time, I'm always offering implicitly or explicitly an account of my own sensibility. Some readers, and they're obviously free to do so, will find that sensibility repellent, I guess. And that's fine. The hope is that most won't and will actually find they want to spend time with me. Well, you make it pretty easy with those phenomenal metaphors, James. <laughs> I, I don't want to jump ahead here because I've got an arc here I'm working on. But uh, I do want to touch on that. And before I forget, I just received a book and I, I can't remember the name of it exactly. But it, it has to do with great black 
authors that mm -hmm. need to look at. I think she's the head of the English department at Columbia. Uh, so to be clear, I, I think it is valuable to look everywhere for this kind of experience. You know, we found it in Russia. So it's not to right. say you can't find it everywhere. Right. right. Certainly some voices have been underrepresented. Absolutely. And so this is something that you're doing. Yeah. And, and probably not doing enough. I, I'm aware of that. Let's say I write nine pieces of a year for the New Yorker. That's that's not very many pieces. One would ideally write 30 pieces um, and be properly expansive and inclusive. Um, it's it's that's tough. But but yeah, I, I, I agree. And and, you know, let's not forget. I mean, in my case, I'm sure that that my encounter with my excited encounter with Russian literature, it had to do, I'm sure, with with certain sort of instinctive connections uh that might well be white men writing to white men i'm perfectly happy to yeah. to uh, admit to that i'd also say that in my case i was sort of predetermined to kindle to that kind of atmosphere because of the religious atmosphere that i grew up in which was a very intense one and so in a sense the world of dostoevsky or tolstoy or gogol th that world of sort of a slightly lunatic religious fervor spoke yeah. extremely powerfully to me uh, in a way that it it wouldn't have done probably to a to a more secular English reader of the same period and class. Well, it's interesting because Dostoevsky often because he he was short of cash, he had to wrap up the work that he was on, and often the way he did that was oh they all sort of found God and uh, you know there we go. <laughs> I didn't like that, but I didn't have your your upbringing. <laughs> Is that too simplistic? No, there's a, there is a certain amount of that in in, uh, in Dostoevsky. There's a moment that always amuses me in The Possessed, uh, or sometimes now translated as Demons, I think, where uh, you know he's coming to the end of a chapter, there's a group of people in the governor's mansion, and then some, someone just runs in from outside into the room and says, the suburbs are on fire. And that's the end of the chapter and you say to yourself aha i know how, what you were up to there dostoevsky you, you you were you were leaving your your episode uh on a on a cliffhanger yes <laughs> one of my favorite lines in dostoevsky is very short it's as loyal as seven thousand poodles <laughs> that's it's, funny your a recent review talked about this author who kept using the word a thousand it triggered my memory of 7,000 food. Great. Yes, that was uh, uh, Anthony Dorr who uses 1,000 yes. a lot. Yes. Yeah. Which, which brings me to positive and, uh, you know, positive and negative reviews. I, I, I'm pleased that you've, I know you've got a social life, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, being honest can interfere with a social life. I'll be honest, I find it harder and harder to write negative reviews. Yeah. I think it has something to do with... With social media, not that I'm on social media, but no, has, no, I, I meant social life. Just the fact. No, 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 no. I, I agree. I agree. It has something to do with into social life. I, yeah, yeah. It absolutely has something to do with social life. I think it also has something to do with social media in the sense that sure. there's an awareness that that you're constantly being watched. I suppose in a way that you weren't. But mainly, I, I think for me, it's it's just that I have a much stronger sense than I used to of the of the way in which a negative review, I guess because I've re been reviewed myself or my wife has that way, the way in which a negative review brings distress into the house, I'll put it like yeah, that. Yeah. For a long time, I blocked that out by saying to myself, you know, the writer doesn't really read it or it's not written for mm -hmm. the writer. It's, written, it's mm -hmm. written over the head of the writer for the audience. The writer should ignore it. But we know that the writer doesn't ignore it. And that's just no. harder for me to block out the suffering individual anymore so i choose my words a little more wisely than i used to i must say though that it bugged me that it seemed like you eased up on zadie smith in mm -hmm. in later yeah it bugged me because i i really agreed you the first time around and then you then you threw in certain not superlatives but phrases I know what you mean. approval and that I know what you mean. me as a reader and it seemed to david foster wallace i can't stand the writing and yet mm -hmm. you 
seem to have moved, you know, you've seen him in a more positive light, which I liked it when you were very aggressive and expressing how I felt. One thing I did with Foster Wallace was try to, I did try to to read him on his own terms. So, right, and I accepted I accepted an invitation at the ninety second Street Y. They were doing this series of sort of first impressions. So I, I accepted an invitation to to speak on a first reading about brief interviews with hideous men. And in fact, it was a book I then taught to my students for a few years until it became actually impossible to teach for all sorts of reasons partly because I couldn't bear to be in that world anymore and also because the students wouldn't really put up with that kind of stuff anymore um it's actually sort of an unteachable text now but I think I I was trying to respond there to what is good about Wallace as a writer which is often he I mean that book brief interviews with Hideous Man is is often it's done in the style of sort of Q and A or monologues. Yeah, um, he's a good essayist, I think. But right, yeah. he shows himself to have a very good ear actually for for speech and the inanities and and cruelties, of violence really in a way of speech. It's just that I can't. Uh, I I guess what I want from Wallace is a I do want him to be a different kind of writer because I want from Wallace. I want him to be on the opposite of what he is. <laughs> I want, I, well, but he's a very broad ironist and comedian who is always underlining and italicizing his irony in comedy. And I right. want him in, instead to be, the, the, it seems to me the joy of irony is that it hides. Yeah, well, um, that's it. You I, don't I, tell I, people you're being ironic. Right. I, I, like, I like subtlety in irony and comedy. And I always want him to be subtler as a comic mm. than he is which is in effect wanting him to be a completely different writer. So in the end, I, I, I don't read him much or, or, or write about him because there's just no real meeting of sensibilities there. Yeah, and yet he's so crazy popular among younger readers. I just, maybe that's just yeah. uh, this is a phase that you go through when you're younger uh, reading. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Okay, let's. Uh, we're winding down here, uh, James. We're we're only going to be about an hour and a half more, or something like that. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> we have mentioned lifeness. Do you have a nice capsule definition of lifeness? It's a slightly silly word um, that I coined simply because I wanted to. I wanted to get round. Some, something of what the problem the problem that we were talking about earlier i wanted to get round this idea that you would continually def- that w- that one would continually define the vitality one finds in a text as being like life it seems to me that there's as much to say about how art isn't like life uh, or creates separate worlds from li- from life as there is to say about about a, you know a direct correspondence so I thought, well, what's the way to give a sense of the absolute primacy and importance of this like lifeness while exploding the idea that there must be any anything like a direct correspondence? The obvious way yes. then is simply take the word and expand it so that we don't have like anymore and we simply have lifeness. Yeah. It's not a great word, um, but it's a, mm. it's, a, it's a way of trying to get at that kind of, that stab at vitality, which all artists aspire to whether whether realists or the most committed avant-garde anti-realists no writer would say that they aren't trying to be vital full of some kind of life and unboring right well except for david foster wallace where he said precisely that he said i want the reader to be bored i want them to feel the boredom yeah i know what you mean i thought that was ridiculous but anyway yeah uh, but there's also artifice. It is all artificial. To go back to our friend Dostoevsky, I mean, you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky are are often used as contrasts, and why not? Because because no one is any in any doubt when they read Anna Karenina or War and Peace that, in addition to a certain amount of artifice, you know, plotting and so on, they're in the presence of a great hospitable repertorial. Although that's to profoundly undersell Tolstoy, but repertorial relation to reality. Um, there is a great deal of life in those books. Then you go to Dostoevsky and 
there's a great deal of life in those books, but you're also in the realm of the melodramatic, uh, yeah. often deeply melodramatic. And that's what Nabokov didn't like about Dostoevsky and the religiously forced. Um, you mentioned it yourself. Raskolnikov must go to his punishment, must be punished, must accept the gospel from, from Sonia and so on. They're, they're very different writers and very different. They're, they're such different realists that you can barely hold them together as being as doing the same kind of thing in the novel. Mm. Um, and I, I totally understand why readers have tended to to like one writer over the other. I happen to like both of them greatly. I think they're the two greatest novels written is Brothers Karamazov and The Peace. And let's not forget, that was what Tolstoy was reading at the end of his life. After, you know, he'd had his differences with, with Dostoevsky, but he'd returned in 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 the religious fervor of his of his later years to, to yes. reading Dostoevsky with great admiration. Hmm, that's interesting. Getting to criticism itself and how you do it, you mentioned that uh, you ask a critic's questions and you answer what for from the writer's perspective or for the writer yeah i think so i i maybe that formulation is a bit bogus i mean i could probably reverse it and say that i ask a writer's questions and answer with a critic's response yeah that's that's too it obvious simply, <laughs> it was simply to get it was simply to give the sense that i'm obviously interested in these sort of technical questions how does this thing work yeah. right why does this line make us laugh why does this metaphor um, make us cry? Whatever. How is this scene structured? What's the point of view? All that sort of stuff that I'm interested in. What is a detail? And I suppose traditionally you would think of these as critics' questions. Not all writers tend, though this is probably a general, bit of a generalization, but they, they tend to, to say about such questions, I, I get on with it instinctively. I, I, I know what I've done when I've, when I've written it, um, but I don't try to ask too much when I'm writing. But they do really want to know how... That's why they'll read someone else's and say, how did they do that? Yes. Right. So that's what, it, that's why I mean, I think I could reverse that formulation in my writing. I'm trying always to be guided. And it's why I think I'm not a, a formal academic in any way. I'm often guided by precisely what you, you mentioned just now. I'm guided by this idea of thinking about how does a writer respond to another writer? How is it word does Zadie Smith walk into a room of friends and fellow writers holding a book, and and she says, guys, you've got to read this. I've just read this. This is unbelievably good. How do all those writers respond? I think you're right. The first thing they ask is, well, the first thing they say is, I've got to read it. And then they say, how good? Good in what way? Tell me, tell me about, enumerate the qualities. And then, as you say, the next question is, how does he, she do that? And, yeah. and how yeah. can I, depending on, the, on, on, on how far advanced these writers are, uh, and how can I learn from that uh, to do something of what I admire uh, of that in my own writing? That is the the lifeblood of movement in literature. And it's the lifeblood to me of criticism, um, because it reminds us properly that criticism has always been long before it got enshrined and calcified in academic study. It was this free flowing dynamic thing between writers it was Coleridge reading Wordsworth it was Diderot reading Richardson or whatever it was uh, Tolstoy reading Dickens and Trollope and deciding as he does it you can see Tolstoy doing it in his diary at one point he says I've been reading Trollope for the last two weeks and then with, with wonderful kind of auteur he says um, fantastically engaging wonderfully readable but in the end too conventional he knows that if he's to do something serious with the novel he'll have to go beyond Trollope it's the same okay. with James reading his peers uh, and his predecessors, the same with Wolf. And it's the same now with Zadie Smith or, 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 or whoever reading people um, and deciding that's OK, but I have to do better than that. And I will do better than that. It's in that sense, I think, that I'm I'm very enmeshed in a kind of writerly relation to to literature. Mm -hmm. As you can tell, I like once I've asked the critics questions, I like them to get into the text and, as it were, shout the answers out from within the text as if I'm standing inside the text sort of yelling the answers out if answer is the right word I don't think it is the right word but yelling out the formulations here I am in the middle of the text and this is what I think is going on and I suppose I feel that is 
a little different from a, a certain amount of of academic work which which often remains more external to the text well the other thing you do is what you call sameness you describe your experience of the arts but using metaphor but you you've got this lovely thing with <laughs> you know the only way that you can really appreciate how good the music is is by listening to me play it yeah so what are you doing there are you are you trying to replicate what the author has done in your criticism um nigel just repeat that last i i my internet connection was a little unstable just repeat that last uh question yeah my question is um what you're doing is you're describing your experience of the art the work yeah uh and in so doing in it in itself it's it's a work a work of art because you want the reader to experience what you experienced experiencing yes the the, the author right yes yeah I mean, it's I, I, it's not the same work of art. It's obviously a simulacrum. No. It's it's a it's a paraphrase and it's a simulacrum. But I do like that idea. I do like that idea of 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 as it were. A, I was going to say a chain of command, but that sounds too authoritative. A chain of enthusiasm, really. Um, yes, yes. I think I, in that introduction, I quote the I, I, I quote the thing of Stanley Cavell saying basically the critic's job is to sort of point at the bit of music or point at the bit of painting, point at the text and say, look there. Um, and <laughs> that, and does wow. seem, that does seem to be really, really important. And, you know, when you, the more you think about criticism as, as this business of saying, look there, the more you notice actually its absence in, in a great deal of contemporary reviews. Right. Well, there is that funny Saturday Night Live skit where Farley, uh, basically, he's interviewing Paul McCartney and all he says is, yeah, you you remember that? That was awesome. That's all he says. Right. (laughs) So there's you don't you, you want to avoid that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. So Cavell can't quite be right that it's just to simply point at it and say you wouldn't need to point at it and then and then say so what's going on here? And then further, how is this thing that I've pointed at, this detail, this phrase, this bit of music, uh, this melody, how does it relate to to the larger formal structure and so on? But I think if you can't do that initial thing of the vicarious handing on, the thing of saying, I'm having this experience, I want you to have this experience. And if I haven't convinced you of how to have this experience, to have, how to share this experience with me then I haven't really been a critic at all well isn't that exactly what publishers want readers to do relay their enthusiasm yeah I suppose that's true yeah yeah I'm not too bothered about what the publishers do and don't no want. no of course of course not but i'm just no, saying I, I know you i know you didn't mean it like that i, I was no, just I was, i'm just talking just, word of mouth word of mouth is the most powerful sale. absolutely absolutely okay two more uh two more things here one you referenced it the you know the kind of the kind of questions that you want to ask of fiction is is realism real how do you, how do we define a successful metaphor what is a character When do we recognize a brilliant use of detail in fiction? What is point of view and how does it work? What is imaginative sympathy? Uh, Why does fiction move us? So these are all key questions for you. Yeah, they are. And we have to read you for the answers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I feel less and less that I have the answers as such, but I have some ways of approaching a set of answers that are that are mine yeah yeah okay i just want to get it in you know we were talking yeah. about how writers talk to each other and try to improve by doing so yeah. like Wyndham lewis craps on virginia wolf 
uh, Mrs. Dalloway basically saying all he did was copy. All she did was copy Joyce and mm-hmm. very well. And yet she says that he's just a pimply little Irishman, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Writers aren't to be, artists aren't, of course, to be trusted necessarily. Though then their resistances and hostilities become extremely interesting if you respect the sensibilities of each author. So the famous one will be Tolstoy's aversion to Shakespeare, which I think can tell us a lot about the kind of realist that Tolstoy wanted to be. I mean, it's true that he expressed his aversion to Shakespeare sort of later in his life when he was becoming a different kind of writer anyway. But I think it also tells you something about how relaxed and unforced and unartificial his great novels are. Um, so that when he encounters, say, King Lear or something, it's interesting, instead of seeing King Lear as the great novelist should have done, as a, as a fantastically profound story about, about an old man who, who gets things terribly wrong in relation to his, to his daughters and in, in relation to power and so on, Tolstoy just sees, what he sees is actually kind of a vulgar opera libretto. He sees uh, absurd, absurd moments, sort of Lear shrieking on the heath, people dressed up as madmen, uh, people being blinded, yelling and shrieking. And it's to him, it's like going to, yeah, it's like going to a terrible, it's like Natasha going to the opera in War and Peace. He, he just, uh, it's just unbearable artifice. That tells us, I think, something about, as I say, something about the kind of calm novelist that Tolstoy wanted to be. And also tells us, about precisely why he wasn't, you know, Trollope or Dickens. He reads Trollope or Dickens and he sees what's great about them. And then he also says to himself, in effect, I don't need to structure my fiction around around all this 19th century realist melodramatic convention. I don't need to have... um, Mm disputed wills and lost heirs and uh, uh, and children who come back you know babies left on on porches and the rest of it i can take all that stuff away and simply proceed with great calm and amplitude through lives um and so actually once you work it out you can see and the same with 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 wolf and joyce you know i think actually she i think the artist in her absolutely recognized what Joyce was up to in Ulysses and was threatened by it. And what that tends to produce in Wolf, alas, is sort of snobbery. You know, this is this is commonplace work by a, by a common sort of laboring mind, and, and I, I and I disdain it. But I think actually she was quite she was quite threatened by by Joyce. It's interesting you mentioned uh, that about Tolstoy chewing the kind of theatrical yeah theatricality. It's exactly the same as uh, Chekhov talking about the complexity of the human mind, but in a very sort of straightforward, plain way. Yes. Yeah, I love I love this image that we have uh, in one of the stories of Chekhov sitting in the Moscow Arts Theatre uh, watching a, a rehearsal of an Ibsen play. And Chekhov is sort of muttering to his, to his friend, Ibsen is no playwright at all. He doesn't see life as it, as it really is. That's not how life is. That, in a way tells us everything you need to know yeah it, in a way it brings us back to the the very earliest stuff you were saying about henry james because there we have a great realist chekhov high-handedly dismissing the greatest predecessor as a playwright in europe and on what basis is he dismissing him he's basically he's saying my stab at life my illusion of life is going to be different from ibsen's and it's going to be more life-filled than Ibsen's. He doesn't get life. It's Harold Bloom's anxiety of influence. Yes, it is. It's the thing that Alain Rob Grier says in, in, in Towards a, a Nouveau Roman. Rob Grier, himself an anti-realist, points out that successive waves of anti-realism tend to be made in the name of greater realism. That's to say they tend to be made in the name of greater stabs at life right yeah. wolf does yeah. it Truffaut does it when he sets out a new kind of filmmaking they're all trying to make some advance as they see it on art's capacity to 
to be filled with with vitality. I just read out the various questions that you ask. The way you start that paragraph is, in this book, I try to ask some of the essential. And I thought, that's very, very tentative of James. It's <laughs> you're, You don't have a slick demeanor here. Just trying to ask? No, you did ask. You Maybe did. I've spent, well, that sounds to me as if I've spent too long in the academy. You know, there's a certain kind of tentative hand right. well, it's, like, it's a bit like your, your presence, though. When I talk, you know, when I see you on these kind of forums, it's, there's this slightly tortured, it's, it's your personality, it must be. I mean, I'm not. It is my personality. And it's also a bifurcation that exists in me between print and speech. In person, I abhor conflict. Uh, and indeed try to avoid it whenever I can. Right. Like most people, I'm stronger in print. And for a long time, I think it was why I was able to write these negative reviews. Print yes. seemed to be the place yeah. where I could actually be truthful. So yeah. in other words, life, ordinary life, social life, seemed to me full of sort of compromises and lies. But print seemed to be the place where I could be brutally honest. And uh, that's sort of still true in a way. I'm not brutally honest in a negative sense anymore, but it's still the place where I can be honest about most honest about what I feel. Print is where I can, I can open up and be myself. And be in control. That too. Um, It's, it's yes. It's one of the reasons I don't love speaking in oral interviews is that I hate seeing the transcript afterwards of, of (laughs) how, how many, any stitches, as it were, I've, I've dropped uh, as I've been sewing my sentences together. The, the sort of amount of dead ends and trailings off and subclauses missed out and horrible stuff. There's something very appealing about getting the sentence right. Yeah. Well, you share that with J.M. Kutsia. <laughs> Probably the only thing I share with J.M. Kutsia, I think. <laughs> well, you reached out to me about... I don't know, it must have been 12, 15 years ago, and it was a really big deal for me. And uh, oh. this has been a really big deal. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, before I, we finish, yes, you haven't actually answered them because I haven't asked. We've touched on what you do, how you do it. What about, what's your mission? Like, why do you do this? Um. I think my mission, it's very much what we were talking about. It's the transmitting of enthusiasm uh, around works of art. Um, But specifically in relation to the novel, there's a particular kind of evangelicalism about transmitting that enthusiasm for me. And that has to do with a feeling that the novel is the form that most perfectly combines both aesthetic pleasure and and the representation of the human case should we put it like that though i'm deeply deeply attached to other art forms music in some ways is is my dearest love and the first thing that i really encountered as a kid it's the novel that puts together for me as it were the music and morality should we put it like that uh, that puts together all the pleasures of aesthetics with the novel's extraordinary ability to to ground itself in human questions. So I have this intense desire to proselytize on behalf of the novel form to readers. And so far, that pleasure hasn't dimmed yet. I'm so happy to hear that. I was going to ask you, will the novel help us to maintain world peace? But uh, that's, a, that's maybe a, for another... <laughs> Absolutely not, I think. <laughs> well, uh, James, uh, thank you. Thank you again uh, for this. It's been a great uh, pleasure. Really a real pleasure, Nigel. Thank you for asking me.